Stolen genes enable parasites to control the host's behavior. Japanese scientists have discovered that some parasites manipulate their hosts by using stolen genes from them, which they probably acquired through a phenomenon called horizontal gene transfer. In this way, they can even convince their hosts to commit suicide. The way parasites can manipulate their hosts has long intrigued scientists. Japanese scientists in a recently published study suggested that some parasites have hundreds of genes that allow them to take control of the host's movement. Moreover, these genes may have been acquired directly from their unsuspecting hosts. The results and description of the research were published in the journal, Current Biology. Many parasites manipulate the behavior of their hosts to ensure their survival and ability to reproduce. Rhinoceros. Cordodes formosinus. Are one of the most sophisticated examples of this type of behavioral control. They are common creatures related to nematodes and can usually be found in bodies of water or around their edges in moist soil. They have thread-like, long, pasta-like bodies. In the larval form, they lead a parasitic lifestyle, usually among terrestrial insects, but adult individuals live freely in seas and inland water bodies. Ringworms are born in water and use aquatic insects, such as mayflies, as hitchhikers to get to land. There they wait until a cricket or praying mantis comes after them. Once the larva enters the host, it begins to grow and manipulates the behavior of its host. Once it reaches an adult form, it persuades its host to enter the water which often ends in its death. But the threadworm can fulfill its life mission in water, which is to start reproducing. Previous research has suggested that threadworms hijack their host's biological pathways and manipulate the host into approaching water. Scientists believe they achieve this by using molecules that mimic those of the host's central nervous system. But exactly how the parasites develop this type of molecular mimicry has remained a mystery until now. To answer this question, the researchers analyzed the gene expression of the threadworm before, during, and after manipulating its host, in this case a praying mantis. They found over 3,000 genes that were more expressed with host manipulation and 1,500 genes that were less expressed. On the other hand, gene expression in the mantis brains was unaffected and could not really be distinguished from that in uninfected mantises. These results indicate that threadworms produce their own proteins to manipulate the nervous system of their hosts. The researchers then searched a protein database to investigate the origins of the genes that threadworms use to manipulate mantises. Surprisingly, many of the threadworm genes that may have played an important role in manipulating their hosts were very similar to those of mantises suggesting that they were acquired through horizontal gene transfer said tape mishina of the rikeen center for biosystems dynamics research Horizontal gene transfer is a biological process in which genes are transferred from one species to another, but not through reproduction. This can have significant evolutionary consequences, enabling organisms to quickly acquire new traits or abilities, potentially helping them adapt to a new environment or lifestyle. 
Further analysis confirmed the initial thesis that the observed molecular mimicry of threadworms is probably the result of horizontal gene transfer from mantises. More than 1,400 threadworm genes were found to match those of mantises, but they were either absent or very different from those of threadworms that did not use mantises as hosts. The authors concluded that the numerous mimicry genes they identified are likely the result of multiple horizontal Thinking. gene transfer events from different mantis species that occurred during the evolution of threadworms. These genes, especially those related to neuromodulation, light attraction, and circadian rhythms, appear to play a large role in manipulating their way to horizontal most five of years one of the main ways bacteria evolved to become resistant to antibiotics. Mishina believes that as we find more examples of horizontal gene transfer between multicellular organisms, we will gain insight into this phenomenon, and also into evolution in general. The many cases of horizontal gene transfer that we found in threadworms could be good models for study. Using this model, we hope to identify the mechanisms underlying horizontal gene transfer and deepen our understanding of evolutionary adaptation, Mishina emphasized. Supercapacitors stuffed with carbon nanobulbs A team of scientists from Poland has an innovative idea for electrode materials used in the construction of supercapacitors. These devices are to include carbon nanobulbs, i.e. multi-layer fullerenes. Supercapacitors, like batteries, are used to store energy, electric charge, and are electrochemical power sources. However, unlike batteries, they can be charged and discharged very quickly, and this process is reversible. Up to a million charging cycles of such a device are possible. Lithium-ion batteries seem to be irreplaceable for now, but they have a lot of disadvantages. Energy is stored in chemical form. Their production requires rare earth metals that are increasingly difficult to obtain. They are charged for quite a long time and a limited number of times, which increases the costs. Maintenance. Additionally, the chemicals they are made of may pose a safety and environmental threat. That is why supercapacitors based on organic materials are such a hope. Although there are already supercapacitors that charge thousands of times faster than batteries, they are still unable to store enough energy. Currently, lithium-ion batteries can store 20 times more energy than supercapacitors. So for now, batteries and supercapacitors complement each other. For example, in hybrid cars or electric vehicles, Batteries provide a large amount of energy to keep the vehicle running for as long as possible. And supercapacitors provide the power to move the vehicle or brake suddenly. While regenerating the device, scientists are therefore looking for materials with better parameters, which will simultaneously accumulate a lot of energy and charge quickly. For now, Carbon materials, for example nanotubes, are often used in supercapacitor electrodes, but the search for materials that will perform even better is still ongoing. A single fullerene is graphene rolled into the shape of a ball, explains Professor Marta plonska Brezinska from the Department of Organic Chemistry, Medical University of Białystok. In carbon nanobulbs, 
smaller fullerenes are trapped inside increasingly larger ones, creating something like subsequent layers of an onion, or matryoshka. A carbon nanobulb contains on average 10 of these increasingly smaller carbon balls. Carbon nanobulbs are extremely durable, resistant to high temperatures and can store a lot of electrical charge. Professor Plonska Brezinska explains that carbon balls offer much better prospects than flat carbon materials, for example when it comes to their doping, i.e. replacing atoms of some elements with others. In this case, it would be replacing some carbon atoms with boron, nitrogen, or phosphorus atoms. In this way, it will be possible to accumulate electric charge more effectively in such heterogeneous structures than in graphene or nanotubes. Therefore, her team proposed using nano-onions to construct supercapacitors. The method for producing nanobulbs is already known, says the researcher. It is known that they can be produced even from diamond nanoparticles, processed under appropriate conditions. Contrary to appearances, nano-diamonds are not expensive at all. And they are commercially easily available, the professor notes. Researchers from the team of Professor Marta Plonska Brezinska from the Medical University of Białystok, in a publication in Scientific Reports, recently showed that multi layer fullerenes combined with organic materials, made mainly of carbon and nitrogen, can be used in supercapacitors. Nanobulbs are just one of the ingredients of the stuffing that forms the supercapacitor's electrode. The materials in question are resistant to high temperatures. They can already withstand 600 degrees Celsius, a great semiconductors and accumulate large amounts of charge. The material is selected to create a porous carbon skeleton. Ions carrying a charge quickly pass through this skeleton to the electrode, which is collected in the material containing carbon nanobulbs. The amount of accumulated charge is expressed by the specific capacity of the material and is 638 F per gram. This is one of the highest values for organic materials reported so far in the scientific literature. Scientists are now working to best combine these two types of materials for producing supercapacitor electrodes. In the near future, we want to use the possibilities offered by artificial intelligence to design devices with the best possible electrochemical properties. It will help us select materials with great potential that are worth testing, says Professor Plonska Brezinska. Neanderthals inherited genes from an unknown population of ancestors of modern humans. The history of the relationship between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals seems to go back much further than previously thought. An international group of scientists has shown that Neanderthals inherited at least 6% its genome from an unknown line of early representatives of modern humans. A team of scientists from the University of Pennsylvania, together with colleagues from Addis Ababa University, the University of Botswana, Fudan University, Hubert Kairuki Memorial University and the University of Yaoundé, have shown that an ancient line of modern humans migrated to Eurasia more than 250,000 years ago. 
years ago, where they interbred with Neanderthals. Over time, representatives of this line became extinct, leaving their genes in the Neanderthal population. Modern humans began to emigrate to Eurasia around 75,000 years ago. Years ago, there they met Neanderthals and also interbred with them. A new study published in the journal Current Biology shows that at that time Neanderthals already carried genes from an earlier, now extinct population of modern humans. We found traces indicating gene flow between the ancient line of modern humans and Neanderthals, says Alexander Platt, one of the authors of the study. This group of individuals left Africa between 250,000 and 250,000 years ago. And 270,000 years ago, they were in a sense, cousins of all humans living today and were much more similar to us than to Neanderthals, he adds. Scientists reached these conclusions after comparative analysis of Neanderthal genomes with a diverse collection of genomes from modern, indigenous populations in sub-Saharan Africa. This study highlights the importance of including ethnically and geographically diverse populations in human genetics and genomics research, said Sarah Tishkoff, lead author of the study. Our ancestors are thought to have interbred with Neanderthals primarily in Eurasia, not Africa. Therefore, there should not be too many Neanderthal genes in sub-Saharan African populations. But a recent study made a puzzling observation. Well, several populations living in the sub-Saharan African region contain DNA fragments resembling Neanderthal DNA. Scientists have not been able to determine how Neanderthal-like DNA entered these populations. Did it come from modern humans who emigrated from Africa, interbred with Neanderthals in Eurasia, and then returned? Or was it the result of an earlier encounter between Neanderthals and modern humans? The analyzes were based on genomes collected as part of the 1000 Genomes Project. This is a project initiated in 2008. Its goal is to create the most detailed catalog of human genetic variability. But this database has its limitations. All these genomes share a relatively recent common ancestor in Central and West Africa. Until now, it was also unclear whether Neanderthal-like DNA was common among sub-Saharan African populations. To find out, Tishkoff used a genetically diverse set of genomes from 180 individuals from 12 different populations in Cameroon, Botswana, Tanzania and Ethiopia. In each of these genomes, scientists identified regions of DNA that resemble Neanderthal DNA. Then they compared the genomes of modern humans with those of Neanderthals who lived about 120,000 years ago. Years ago. For the purposes of their research, they developed a statistical method that allowed them to determine the origin of Neanderthal-like DNA in modern populations of sub-Saharan Africa. They found that all sub-Saharan African populations contain Neanderthal-like DNA, indicating that the phenomenon is common. In most cases, this Neanderthal-like DNA comes from an ancient evolutionary line of modern humans and was passed on to Neanderthals during their migration from Africa to Eurasia around 250,000 years ago. 
years ago. Scientists found that about 6% the Neanderthal genome came from this ancient line of modern humans. In some sub-Saharan African populations, scientists have also found evidence that modern humans interbred with Neanderthals in Eurasia and then returned to Africa. The most traces in the DNA of these return migrations, up to 1.5%. Genome were identified among people currently living in Ethiopia and Cameroon. The discovery of this ancient lineage of modern humans is really exciting for future research, because it gives us a different perspective on human evolution, said Daniel Harris, co-author of the study. Since we do not have DNA sequences of modern humans from such ancient times, Identifying these sequences will shed light on very early human evolution in Africa, he adds.